Hi everybody, it's Haley here from the Gale Library in Newton, here with you for Fable Haven Monday. We are now on chapter seven. Can you believe I've been doing this for six weeks already? It's flown by. So chapter six, if you guys remember, uh, was called Maddox. And Maddox was a gentleman that came to see Grandpa Sorensen about trading some fairies. And at the end of it, they sent the kids off to bed because they were gonna do some negotiating. Uh, and I did just read the next chapter to myself. Um, it's pretty fun. <laughs> so if you haven't heard, the library is open. Our open hours are Monday and Wednesday from 12 to 6 and on Tuesday and Saturday from 9 to 1. So you don't need an appointment and if you're fully vaccinated, you don't need to wear your mask. You can just come on in, ring the bell um, and we will let you in, but no appointment necessary. So I look forward to seeing you guys soon. We've had some visitors in the kids room today and it's been lovely to see you. So let's do Fable Haven chapter seven. I'll give you a quick recap of chapter six um, and the last paragraph of chapter six. No grousing. I have negotiations to conduct with Maddox tonight. We can't have young people underfoot. You'll need to stay in your room no matter what commotions you hear downstairs. Our um, negotiations can be a bit spirited, understood? Yes, said Kendra. I want to negotiate, said Seth. Grandpa shook his head. It's a dull business. You kids have a good sleep. No matter what you think you hear, Maddox said as Kendra and Seth departed the study, we aren't having fun. I think they are going to have fun. <laughs> All right, so we are on chapter seven of Brandon Mull's Fable Haven, and chapter seven is called Prisoner in a Jar. The floorboards creaked gently as Kendra and Seth tiptoed down the stairs. Early morning light filtered through closed blinds and drawn curtains. The house was still, the opposite of last night. Beneath their covers, in the dark attic the night before, Kendra and Seth had found sleeping impossible as they listened to howling laughter, shattering glass, twittering flutes, slamming doors, and the constant din of shouted conversations. When they opened the door to sneak down to spy on the festivities, Lena was always seated at the foot of the attic stairs, reading a book. Go back to bed, she said each time they attempted a reconnaissance mission. Your father is still negotiating. Eventually, Kendra fell asleep. She believed it was the silence that had finally awakened her in the morning. When she rolled out of bed, Seth arose as well. Now, they were creeping down the stairs in hopes of glimpsing the aftermath of the night's revelry. The brass coat hook had toppled in the entry hall, surrounded by hooked triangles of broken glass. A painting lay face down on the floor, frame cracked. A primitive symbol was scrawled on the wall in orange chalk. They passed quietly into the living room. Tables and chairs had been overturned. Lampshades hung crooked and torn. Empty glasses, bottles and plates lay scattered about. Several of them cracked or broken. A ceramic pot lay in pieces around a pile of soil and the remnants of a plant. Food stains appeared at every turn. Melted cheese caked into the carpeting. Tomato sauce drying on the arm of a love seat. A squashed eclair oozing custard all over the ottoman. Grandpa Sorensen was snoring on the couch, using a curtain for a blanket. The curtain rod was still attached. He clutched a wooden scepter like a teddy bear. The strange staff was carved with vines twisting around the shaft and topped by a large pine cone. Despite all the commotion they heard in the night before, Grandpa was the only sign of life. Seth roamed off towards the study. Kendra was about to follow when she noticed an envelope on the table near Grandfather. A thick seal of crimson wax had been broken and part of a folded paper protruded invitingly. Kendra glanced at Grandpa Sorensen. He was faced away from the letter and showing no sign of stirring. If he didn't want a letter read, he shouldn't leave it out in the open, right? It wasn't as if she was stealing it unopened from his mailbox. And she had several unanswered questions about Fablehaven, not the least of which concerned what was actually going on with her grandma. Kendra eased over to the table, a queasy feeling in her stomach. Maybe she should have Seth read it. Invading privacy wasn't really her forte. But it would be so simple. The letter was right in front of her, conveniently sticking out of an open envelope. Nobody would even know. She tipped the envelope up and found there was no address or address return label. The envelope was blank. Hand delivered? Had Maddox bought it? Probably. 
After a final glance to ensure Grandpa still looked comatose, Kendra slid the cream-coloured paper out of the envelope and unfolded it. The message was written in bold script. Stanley, I trust this missive finds you in good health. It has come to our attention that the SES has been exhibiting unusual activity in the northeast of the United States. We remain uncertain whether they have pinpointed the location of Fablehaven, but one unconfirmed report suggests that they are in communication with an individual on your preserve. Mounting evidence implies the secret is out. I need not remind you about the attempted infiltration of a certain preserve in the interior of Brazil last year, nor the significance of that preserve in connection with the significance of yours. As you well know, we have not detected such aggression, aggressive activity from the SES in decades. We are preparing to reassign additional resources to your vicinity. As always, secrecy, misdirection remain top priorities. Be vigilant. I continue to search diligently for a resolution to the situation with Ruth. Do not lose hope. With everlasting fidelity, S. Kendra reread the letter. Ruth was her grandma's name. What situation? The SES had to be the Society of the Evening Star. What did the S at the end of the letter stand for? The entire message seemed a bit vague, probably deliberately. Look at this, Seth whispered from the kitchen. Kendra jumped, jumped, every muscle in her body tensing. Grandpa smacked his lips and shifted on the couch. Kendra stood tempor temporarily immobilized by guilty panic. Seth was not looking at her. He was stooped over something in the kitchen. The Grandpa became still again. Kendra folded the letter and slipped it back into the envelope, trying to situate it as she had found it. Moving stealthily, she joined Steph, who crouched over muddy hoof, hoof prints. Were they riding horses in here, he asked. It would explain the racket, she murmured, trying to sound casual. Lena appeared in the doorway, dressed in a bathrobe, hair awry. Look at you, early risers, she said softly. You caught us before cleanup. Kendra stared at Lena, trying to keep her expression unreadable. The housekeeper showed no indication of having seen her spying on the letter. Seth pointed at the hoof prints. What the heck happened? The negotiations went well. Is Maddox still here? Seth asked, hopefully. Lena shook her head. He left in a taxi about an hour ago. Grandpa Sorensen shuffled into the kitchen, wearing boxes, socks, and an undershirt stained with brown mustard. He squinted at them. What are you all doing up at this ungodly hour? It's after seven, Seth said. Grandpa covered a yawn with his fist. He held the envelope in the other hand. I'm feeling a little under the weather today. Might go lie down for a spell. As you were. He shambled off, scratching his thigh. You kids may want to play outside this morning, Lena said. Your grandfather was up until just 40 minutes ago. He had a long night. I'm going to have a tough time taking Grandpa seriously when he tells us how to show respect for the furniture, Kendra said. It looks like he drove a tractor through here. Pulled by horses, added Seth. Maddox enjoys the celebration, and your grandfather is an accommodating host, Lena said. Without your grandmother here to reign in the merriment, things got a little too festive. Didn't help that they invited the satyrs. She nodded at the muddy hoof prints. Satyrs? Kendra asked. Like goat men? Lena nodded. Some would say they liven up the party too much. Those are goat prints? Seth asked. Seder prints, yes. I wish I could have seen them, Seth mourned. Your parents would be glad you didn't. Satyrs would only teach you bad manners. I think they invented them. I'm sad we missed the party, Kendra said. Don't be. It was not a party for young people. As caretaker, your grandfather would never drink, but I can't vouch for the satyrs. We'll have a proper party before you leave us. Will you invite the satyrs? Seth asked. We'll see what your grandfather says, Lena said, doubtfully. Maybe one. Lena opened the fridge and poured two glasses of milk. Drink your milk and then run along. I have some heavy cleaning ahead of me. Kendra and Seth took their glasses. Lena opened the pantry, removing a broom and dustpan, and left the room. Kendra drank her milk in several deep swallows and set her empty glass on the counter. Want to go for a swim? she asked. I'll catch up, Seth said. He still had milk in his glass. Kendra walked away. After finishing his milk, Seth peeked into the pantry. So many shelves packed with so much food. One shelf featured nothing but large jars of homemade preserves. Closer investigation revealed that the jars were lined up three deep. Seth backed out of the pantry and looked around. Re-entering the pantry, he removed a large jar, jar of boysenberry preserves, pulling another jar forward from the second row to disguise the absence. They might miss a half-empty jar from the fridge, but one of the many unopened jars from the overstuffed pantry 
not likely. He could be sneakier than Kendra knew. A fairy, the fairy, balanced on a twig protruding from a low hedge beside the pool, arms extended to either side. She walked along the tiny limb, adjusting it as it wobbled. The further out she got, the less stable she became. The miniature beauty queen had platinum hair, a silver dress and glittering translucent wings. Seth sprang forward, splashing downward with the pool skimmer. The blue mesh struck the twig, but the fairy darted away in the last instant. She hovered, shaking a scolding finger at Seth. He swung the skimmer again, and the nimble fairy evaded capture a second time, soaring well out of range. You shouldn't do that, Kendra said from the pool. Why not? Maddox catches them. Out in the wild, Kendra corrected, these already belong to Grandpa. It's like hunting lions at the zoo. Maybe hunting lions at the zoo would be good practice. You're going to end up making the fairies mad at you. They don't mind, he said, creeping up on a fairy with wide, gauzy wings, fluttering inches above a flower bed. They just fly away. He slowly moved the pool skimmer into position. The fairy was directly beneath the mesh, less than two feet away from captivity. With a flick of his wrist, he slapped the skimmer down sharply. The fairy dodged around it and glided off. What are you going to do if you catch one? Probably let it go. So what's the point? To see if I can do it. Kendra boosted herself out of the water. Well, obviously you can't. They're too fast. Dripping, she walked over to her towel. Oh my gosh, look at that one. She pointed at the base of a blossoming bush. Where? Right there. Wait until she moves. She's practically invisible. He, start, he stared at the bush, unsure whether she was teasing him. A bobbing distortion began warping the leaves and blossoms. Whoa! See? She's clear, like glass. Seth edged forward, clutching the pool skimmer. Seth, don't! Suddenly he charged, opting for a rapid assault this time. The transparent fairy flew away, vanishing against the sky. Why won't they hold still? They're magic, Kendra said. The fun is just looking at them, seeing all the variety. Oh, real fun. Kind of like when mum makes us go on drives to look at the leaves changing colour. I want to grab some breakfast. I'm starving. Then go. Maybe I'll have better luck without you walking. Kendra walked back to the house wrapped in her towel. She entered the back door and found Lena dragging a broken coffee table into the kitchen. Much of the surface on the table had been made of glass. Most of it was broken. Need a hand? Kendra asked. Mine are plenty. Kendra went anyway and grabbed the other end of the table. They set it on the counter of the spacious kitchen. Another other broken objects rested there as well, included the jagged fragments of the ceramic pot Kendra had noticed earlier. Why are you piling everything here? This is where the brownies come. Brownies? Come look. Lena led Kendra to the basement door, pointing out at a second little door at the base, about the size a cat would use. The brownies have a special hatch that admits them to the basement. They can use this door to enter the kitchen. They are the only magical creatures with permission to enter the house at will. The brownie portals are guarded by magic against all other creatures of the forest. But why let them in? Oh, the brownies are useful. They repair things, they make things. They're remarkable craftsmen. They'll fix the broken furniture? Improve it if they can. Why? It's in their nature. They will accept no reward. How nice of them, Kendra said. In fact, tonight, remind me to leave out some cooking ingredients. By morning, they will have baked us a treat. What will they cook? You never know. You don't make requests. You just leave out ingredients and see how they combine them. How fun. I'll leave out a bunch. No matter what strange combinations you leave, they always invent something delicious. There is so much I don't know about Fable Haven, Kendra declared. How big is it? The preserve stretches for many miles in some directions, much bigger than you would suppose. And there are creatures throughout. Throughout most of it, Lena said. But as your grandfather has, father has warned you, some of those creatures can be deadly. There are many places on the property where even he does not fair, dare venture. I want to know more. I want to know all the details. Be patient. Let it unfold. She turned to the refrigerator and changed the subject. You must be hungry. A little. I'll whip up, I'll whip up some eggs. Will Seth want some? Probably, Kendra said, leaning against the counter. I've been wondering, is everything from mythology true? Explain what you mean. Well, I've seen fairies and evidence of satyrs. Is it all real? No mythology or religion that I know of holds all the answers. Most religions are based on truths, but they are also polluted by the philosophies and imaginations of men. I take it your question refers to Greek mythology. Is there a pantheon of pretty gods, petty gods who constantly bicker and interfere in the lives of mortals? I know of no such beings. 
Are there some true elements to those ancient stories and beliefs? Obviously, you're talking to a former Naiad. Scrambled? What? The eggs? Oh, sure. Lena began cracking eggs into her pan. Many of the beings who dwell here existed gracefully when primitive man forged in ragged tribes. We taught man the secrets of bread and clay and fire, but man became blind to us over time. Interaction with mortals became rare, and then mankind began to crowd us. Explosions in population and technology stole many of our ancient homes. Mankind held no particular malice towards us. We simply faded into colourful caric caricatures, inhabiting myths and fables. There are quiet corners all over the world where our kind continue to thrive in the wild. And yet the day will inevitably come when the only space remaining to us will be these sanctuaries, a precious gift from enlightened mortals. But it's so sad, Kendra said. Do not frown. My kind do not dwell on these concerns. They forget the fences enclosing these preserves. I should not speak of what used to be. With my fallen mind, I see the changes much more clearly than they do. I feel the loss more keenly. Grandpa said, a night is coming when all the creatures here will run wild. Midsummer's Eve, the festival night. What's it like? I better not say. I don't think your grandfather wants you kids worrying about it until the time comes. He would rather have scheduled your visit to avoid the festival night. Kendra tried to sound nonchalant. Will we be in danger? Now I've got you worried. You will be fine if you follow the instructions your grandfather gives you. What about the Society of the Evening Star? Maddox sounded worried about them. The Society of the Evening Star has always been a threat, Lena admitted, but these preserves have endured for centuries, some for millennia. Fablehaven is well protected, and your grandfather is no fool. You needn't worry about speculative rumours. I'll not say any more on the subject. Cheese in your eggs. Oh, yes, please. With Kendra gone, Seth got out the equipment he had bundled into his towel, including his emergency kit and the jar he had smuggled from the pantry. The jar was now empty, washed, clean in the bathroom sink. Taking out his pocket knife, Seth used the awl to punch holes in the lid. Unscrewing the top, he gathered bits of grass, flower, petals, a twig and a pebble and placed them in the jar. Then he wandered across the garden from the pool, leaving the skimmer behind. If he failed, he would resort to cunning. He found a good spot not far from a fountain and then took the small mirror from a cereal box and placed it inside the jar. Setting the jar on a stone bench, he settled in the grass nearby, lid in hand. It did not take the fairies long. Several flitted around the fountain. A few drifted over, lazily orbiting the jar. After a couple of minutes, a small one with wings like a bee landed on the edge of the jar, staring into it. Apparently satisfied, she dropped inside and began admiring herself in the mirror. Soon she was joined by another and another. Seth moved slowly closer until he was in, within a reach of the jar. All the fairies exited it. He waited. Some flew off, new ones came, one entered the jar, followed quickly by two more. Seth pounced, slapping the lid onto the jar. The fairies were so quick. He expected to catch all three, but two whizzed out just before the lid covered the opening. The remaining fairy pushed against the lid with surprising force. He screwed it shut. The fairy inside stood no taller than his little finger. She had fiery red hair and iridescent dragonfly wings. The incensed fairy pounding her tiny fist noiselessly against the wall of the jar. All around him, Seth heard the tinkling of miniature bells. The other fairies were pointing and laughing. The fairy in the jar beat against the glass even harder, but to no avail. Seth had captured his prize. Oh no, he caught a fairy. <laughs> Grandpa dipped the wand into the bottle and raised it to his lips. As he blew gently, the bubbles streamed from the plastic circle. The bubbles floated across the porch. You never know what will fascinate them, he said, but bubbles usually do the trick. Grandpa sat in a large wicker rocker. Kendra, Seth and Dale sat nearby. The setting sun streaked the horizon with red and purple. I try not to bring unnecessary technology onto the property, he continued, dipping the wand again. I just can't resist with bubbles. He blew and more bubbles took shape. A fairy, glowing softly in the fading light, approached one of the bubbles. After considering it for a moment, she touched it and the bubble turned bright green. Another touch, it was an inky blue. Another, and it was gold. Grandpa kept the bubbles coming and more fairies came to the porch. Soon, all the bubbles were changing colours. The hues became more luminous as the fairies competed against, another, against one another. Bubbles ruptured with flashes of light. 
One fairy gathered bubbles until she had assembled a bouquet that resembled a bunch of multicolored grapes. Another fairy entered a bubble and inflated it from the inside until it rippled in size and burst with a violent flash. A bubble near Kendra appeared to be full of winking fireflies. One near Grandpa turned to ice, fell to the porch and shattered. The fairies flocked near Grandpa, ease, eager to get the next bubbles. He kept them coming and the fairies continued to display their creativity. They filled bubbles with shimmering mist, they linked them in chains, they transformed them into fireballs. The surface of one reflected like a mirror, another took on the shape of a pyramid, another crackled with electricity. When Grandpa put the bubble solution away, the fairies gradually disappeared. The dwindling sunset was almost gone. A few fairies played among the chimes, making soft music. Unbeknown to most of the family, Grandpa said, a few of your cous cousins have visited me here. None of them came close to figuring out what is really going on. Didn't you give them clues? Kendra asked. No more or less than I gave you. They were not of the proper mindset. Was it Erin? Seth asked. She's a goober. You be kind, Grandpa scolded. What I want to say is that I admire how you children have taken all this in your stride. You have adapted impressively to this unusual place. Lena said we could have a party with goat people, Seth said. I wouldn't hold my breath if I were you. Why was she talking about satyrs? We found hoof prints in the kitchen, Kendra said. Yeah, things got a little bit out of hand last night, Grandpa admitted. Trust me, Seth, consorting with satyrs is the last thing a boy your age needs. Then why did you do it? Seth asked. A visit from a fairy broker is a significant event and carries certain expectations. I'll concede that the merriment borders on foolishness. Can I try blowing bubbles? Seth asked. Another night. I'm planning a special exertion for, for tomorrow. In the afternoon, I need to visit the granary and I mean to take you with me. Let you see more of the property. Will we get to see something besides fairies? Seth asked. Probably. I'm glad, Kendra said. I want to see everything you're willing to show us. All in good time, my dear. From her breathing, Seth was pretty sure Kendra was asleep. He sat up slowly. She did not move. He coughed weakly. She did not twitch. He eased out of bed and crossed the attic floor to his dresser. Quietly, he opened the third drawer down. There she was. Twig, grass, pebble, flower petals, mirror and all. In a dark room, her, in her inherent glimmer glimmer illuminated the entire drawer. Her tiny hands were splayed against the wall of the jar and she looked up at him desperately. She chirped something in a twittering language, motioning, him for, motioning, motioning for him to open the lid. Seth glanced over his shoulder. Kendra had not budged. Good night, little fairy, he whispered. Don't worry, I'll feed you some milk in the morning. He began shutting the drawer. The panicked fairy redoubled her frantic prostitution protestations, protestations, <laughs> I'm nearly at the end of the chapter, <laughs> protestations, it looked like she was about to cry, which made Seth pause, maybe he would let her go tomorrow, it's okay little fairy, he said gently, go to sleep, I'll see you in the morning, she clasped her hands together and shook them in a pleading motion, begging with her eyes, she was so pretty, that fiery red hair against her creamy skin, the perfect pet, way better than a hen, what chicken could set bubbles on fire? Closing the drawer, he returned to his bed. And there she is, look, I don't know if you guys can see. The fairy in a jar. That was the end of chapter seven. Chapter eight, uh-oh, is called Retaliation. I'm hoping the fairies aren't gonna retaliate. I haven't read it yet, but uh, if you remember what Grandpa Sorensen said, if you upset the fairies, they might come back to you. <laughs> so thank you guys for tuning in to chapter seven of Fable Haven. I will be here next Monday with chapter eight, retaliation um, at 4 p.m. Have a great week. It looks like it is nice weather out there. The sun is shining again, so enjoy. Take care, you guys. See you next week. <laughs>